Right, matchless, G12, finished. Now, we've been waiting, as you know, from the last time for a bearing. Everything's done now. To just a recap on what it actually came in for. Had a broken crankshaft, and we had to replace a crankshaft, a conrod, and a, a main bearing. It put rings in it as well. But it's all been done. I'm not gonna go on too much about it now, because we're gonna take the bike out in a short while. We're gonna start it up for you, we're gonna ride it. Um, just also, as I mentioned before, if you take anything apart, don't forget, you can always get your manuals, you can get your parts list. And this is Bruce Mainsmith. This is a, a copy done by the National Motorcycle Museum. The archive division will give you the prints on all these old bikes. Matchlist is a bike that is harder to get parts for and documentation from them is priceless really because me trying to source parts of this was very difficult. Now I was lucky I got a crankshaft, and I got that through a friend. I got it through Andy Tierman, um, good old Andy, and uh, Peter Ronson. They provided me with a conrod and a crankshaft. So thanks again, lads. Brilliant. Thanks for that. Okay, so the Norton Dominator 99, 650, um, sorry, 600. Um, the last time you saw the engine was on the bench in the engine stand. It's now back in the frame. The gearbox has been overhauled that's back in the frame. The only thing we're waiting for here, we're waiting for a side stand. Now a side stand has to clamp onto the frame tube and it's positioned between the engine and the gearbox. So before we put the primary chain case back on, we need to clamp this onto the frame. So it goes sort of here. And what we do, because if you clamp it, it could actually work loose and move and then you can't get to these bolts. It's right behind this primary chain case. So we're gonna just tack weld it in place once it's in the right position. So all we really need for this now, like I say, is a side stand, um, a clutch cable, and we're done. And on the bench, I'll just show you, because we had trouble with the, um, the back um, primary chain case cover. There was a slider. And I'll show you how you do a quick repair. So just find that for you. You probably remember when we looked at this, I'm gonna put some paint on this, but this sliding plate was all loose. Now, now it works properly. The idea of this is the gearbox main shaft comes through here, and when you adjust the chain, this will either go backwards or forwards. It just works as a seal. And the easy repair on this is to drill the rivets out, reshape this, because it had lost its profile, and it's all slack and loose. It's just been riveted back in place. So that makes it good. That's how it should be. But to put a bit of paint on this, and that should be okay. So really, that's quite a quick fix. So everything else now um, is done. We sorted out his wiring. Um, we've got some pictures, and we'll show you the pictures. They've been cut in later on. Uh, we, we shrink wrapped a lot of the, the loom to make it look better. It was all done with tape. We've re-rubber mounted the tank, so it's got nice clean lines on it now. Everything is tidy, uh, it's got a new um, brake switch. Everything now is done, and we sorted out, uh, remember we were talking about his rear wheel, the adjuster bolts, that's all done. Also the front brake cable is a grommet through the bracket on the side. But yeah, it's done, so this will be a good one, and hopefully, um, it'd be a week time maybe that we can have this one out and running and you can see this one So that's that's coming on quite well Right the Scott we started it now. Well, we haven't started the engine. We started doing the, the repair work now We had the points assembly off and I said to you at the time they were corroded So I've taken the contacts apart cleaned those up with a, a points file got all the oxidation oxidization off put those back into the magneto, and now we've got a spark. So we're gonna just turn the Kickstarter over and you can see it's sparking, it's sparking on the plugs. I'm just gonna show you the spark on the plugs now. Got a good healthy spark, so the mag should be okay, the magneto. So just gonna push down the kickstart. So we've got a good blue spark on both those plugs. Today, we're not gonna cover very much on this today but we are gonna do a proper video on this. And now I've got to a stage where I will concentrate the work on this. My next job will be 
uh, reinstalling the carburetor, just clean it out, put the carb back on, put the windows back on the transfer ports, we cover the carb up, and then we're going to use brake cleaner and clean a lot of this crud away from this engine and get it so it's fairly clean. And then really, we're looking at um, putting the tank back on, flushing the tank out first, getting the pump to make sure we've got a flow with the pump. What we'll probably do is I've got a set of rollers. We'll probably put this down on the floor, back wheel into the rollers, spin the back wheel with the rollers and make sure that the pump is pumping properly before we try and start it. That way, there isn't any chance of starving the engine of oil when we fire it up, because if it fires up on that petrol, we want to make sure the oil is mixing, so we get a delivery of oil through the crankcase and doing its job before we uh, try and start it properly. So yeah, it's all good. Um, need to change the coolant. It has got coolant still in the engine, which is good, and hopefully that head won't leak. So fresh coolant in there, mixed up. So we, we should be ready to go fairly soon. So hopefully next week, we can have this running for you as well. Right, you've probably seen this in the back of the workshop. It's been moved on the bench or for the bench a few times. This has been here for about a year. Um, Customers Tiger Cub, little um, 200. Um, yeah, it, it was a job that he wanted it sort of like recommissioned. The wheels have completely shot. What I mean by that is the rims, the chrome had gone badly. When the tires were removed, the back of the rims were so badly corroded with rust, they weren't serviceable. And I said, look, you might as well have your wheels rebuilt, new spokes, new rims, new tapes, tubes and tires, and do the job properly. And um, I've done all the frame for him, but just cleaned this back and rebushed it and and done all the little bits that needed to be done to it. It's had the loom put back in. It's had where bushes are worn. I've made bushes for it. Got it to this stage. He's had his tank sent away and painted and his mud guards and the stays. So next week, another one next week, we'll, we'll build up the mud guards, put those back. Then we can put the wheels in. We have a rolling chassis. And then we'll have a quick recap on what the engine's like. It's on the bench. Um, it has been stripped out for a long time, so I've got to remember what I'm going to say to you. But it's quite a fun little bike. I think most people like these because it is your intro level into classic bikes. And for the older generation, it's a lighter bike to ride than one of these big, you know, like the Commando or the A10 or the Matchless. Much, much lighter bike, more manageable as you get older. So we'll just show you where we are with the engine. So that, that's not a bad little bike, really. It won't be concourse, but it'll be nice. Okay, so the Tiger Cub engine. Been stripped out, and actually not too bad. So in the box here, right, we have the gearbox. Well, we have what's left of the gearbox. We have gear selector. We have the main shaft, the lay shaft. Our old favorite, the sleeve gear. Um, but all this seems quite good. And here we have a carburetor. Now this, this has got a much bigger carb. It was a mod that was done. The cylinder head, we haven't taken the valves out yet. The alternator, this does look like it's cooked. I say cooked, you can see here, it's got very hot, so just take the rotor out. And you can see there's a lot of heating up here. So this will need to be replaced. There's been a dead short in the wiring in here. And um, yeah, that can only be replaced. It's not an arm and a leg, but it has to be done, otherwise you won't have any charging. So that's the primary chain case. And I think in this box here, we've got the piston, remember rightly. And this is not too bad. We'll probably hone this barrel out, and the barrel rather. There's a nip up bit there, but we can clean this up, a new set of rings. The only thing with this, it has a later barrel. And I'll show you here, we'll just go over to the barrel. This is the barrel. Now, most people know, the early ones were a round barrel. This is called a square barrel. It's a later one. Now it's got a few fins broken. I was in the process of making up a replacement fin out of a piece of cast. Now I just need to get that welded in place. It's something I can't do because you need to have a brick oven for it. Get it hot, do the welding with a, a cast rod and let it cool down slowly because it will crisp. Well, the, the, um, 
the carbon content in cast iron, it isn't easy stuff to play with. We've got one fin missing there, we've got one missing here. So they need to be done because it, it won't look right with two broken fins. These parts here are just the cycle parts. These are just um, back brake, back plates, uh, minus the shoes at the moment, uh, the bits of the tank and the horn. And in here, um, we've got the clutch, primary drive chain and uh, points assembly. But what I really want to show you is the engine. Well, what's left of the engine here on the bench. We've got it stripped out because the cam bush, if I just show you here, there's quite a lot of movement in that bush. So you can, you can hear it and you can see the movement. That's quite an easy job. Now, it's already been split because we had the gear, gear box out of it. So if we just now take that half away, it's a very simple engine really. It's just one of the shim washers. We'll just take the crank out. Now the crank itself, now sometimes these are on a needle race or they can be a bush, but it doesn't seem to be any wear in there, so that's okay. But the bush in question is behind this cover here. I've got one screw, I think, holding it in place. So if I take the screw out, just checking. No, there's no screw. It's a long time ago since, I, it's been here a year, this one. So it does need to be sorted out now. Now this is a bush, it's only a top hat bush. And all we do, we put this case in the oven, heat that up, control temperature, and we can just drift that bush out and put a new one in. And we'll probably replace this one as well, which is in the main part of the crankcase. Oil pump here, which is driven off this, this worm gear. Um, this will be taken apart as well. And the whole thing will be totally, um, all the bearings dropped out and, and just checked. But the camshaft is good. These actually are a good little engine. They're, they're a bike that was used for <coughs> competition trials. And in America, they called it a mountain cub. A really nice trials bike. Um, I've got a friend who's got one and uh, it's in quite a state, but it will be nice when it's finished. But I think they're quite a nice little bike, really. Um, and a little bit underrated. They've got quite a lot of power for what they are. And uh, yeah, I think when it's up together, I think you'd be quite surprised how nice it is. So this is our next project, really, that's been here for some time we need to finish. Okay, I want to make a, a reference to replacing bearings and why we keep the originals in if they're in good condition and why we tend not to use a lot of the um, replacement bearings that are on the market now. Now this bearing here, it has been replaced, this is out of a gold star I was doing. The things that we check for, if you look at the quality of this bearing, it is of a high standard. And we look for where the, the rollers have scoring and they run on the track on the inside and the outside race here. Um, we look for roughness of running when it's put back together, I'll show you in a moment. We look for any damage, and the scoring is a big thing. The track in the outer race, we look at this track, and you can see here, it has worn a little bit. Now this is why this one was replaced, but look at the quality of this bearing. Now, I'm just gonna put that back together, and you'll see, we clean this out on kerosene, blow it out with an airline, then we lightly oil these and spin them up and see what they're like. This one, it's not been cleaned, but sometimes they sound a bit rough, a bit rumbly. Now, the quality, look again. Now look at this one. Sometimes this is all you can get, but the cage on this is just a pressed tin. Well, it's not exactly tin, but you can see what I mean. It's not the same standard at all. It's obviously a bearing which is the correct size for a replacement, but it's not of the same quality. So I tend to don't like these bearings and that's why it's been replaced for a better bearing, more of that standard. But these cheap bearings that you can acquire, I'm not saying they're bad, 
but you can get these off the internet and if it's all you can get it's fine but don't settle for cheap replacement bearings because they won't have the lifespan. Now in here I can feel ridging. Now if I just wipe that away I can put my finger now in here and I can see ridges and that is a much cheaper bearing. That doesn't have the life of a, a bearing like this. Old bearings, if they've been lubricated and always been changed, they shouldn't wear. On the Norton in question, I had hold of the crankshaft and what it was, it wasn't the bearing that was worn, it was the, the crankshaft, when the bearing was put onto the crankshaft, there was a little bit of movement. It was scoring a few marks on the crank and obviously at some stage, the bearing probably started turning a little bit. And all I'd done was cleaned up the crank, and people do this, and it's quite okay, clean the crankshaft up, and some Loctite. So it had a little bit of Loctite put around the bearing, then it was put onto the crankshaft. That's fine. That's a normal engineering done, thing that's done. And I think you'll find that this bearing here has had Loctite, because there's residue here. But if you find a bearing is a bit slack on the shaft, and if it's right up to where it should be, the shoulder, a little bit of Loctite, bearing's put in place and it won't move. So that's all it was on that Norton. Okay, G12 matchless, 650, this one 1960. Um, this is the last of the uh, Dynamo and um, Magneto models. A year later it went to an alternator. We're just going to show you a few things on the bike, um, what matchless do different from other people. To say one thing, Matchless was never as popular as BSA Triumph and Norton. It didn't have that same sort of uh, draw for the younger generation. This, uh, if I'm honest, uh, more of a, an older person's bike. Um, quite often used with a sidecar. It's a good bike, it's got that third bearing, so it's a smooth engine, but it was never a bike, say, the Ton Up boys would have gone for. They would have gone for the Triumphs and the BSAs and the Nortons. But the things it used to have that people like, some and some don't, um, we look at this for instance here. This is the toolbox cover and battery cover. It looks quite nice. So I'm just going to remove this for you so you can have a look inside. So you've got provision here for your battery, 6 volt battery. He's got his tools in a bit of toweling here. Um, he's actually got, instead of having the old style voltage regulator box, he's got a modern device here, as you can see. Um, yeah, works well. Uh, not really a lot to say about the bike on this side, really. Oh, I can't show you, but these silencers, basically there's a very small baffle in the, in the megaphone style, but the main part of the baffle was actually held in the exhaust pipe. So when you pull the silencer off the baffle is still actually a lot of it is still actually in the end of the pipe which is unusual i've never seen that before gives them a nice ride a very comfortable seat sits up fairly high um but i'll do that in a moment we come around this side I'll just show you around here now on this side of the bike we've got the oil tank but this again has a panel a cover looks similar to the toolbox cover on the other side this is just a cover now a lot of people used to call this sandwich box because it's just an outer cover. It's more for styling, but you either like it or you don't. It's a bit like Marmite, really. This side of the engine, I would say, is the nicest side. It's very attractive to look at. You notice here we've got two oil lines. This is the feed from the oil tank into the engine, and this one's returned. So this has two pumps, which is unusual. And I think I've showed you when we're working on this, but it has two separate barrels. So it's both cylinder heads are separate and both barrels are separate. And in here we've got a rocker gear, but you don't have a tappet adjuster in the conventional sense. It has like an eccentric. So you slacken off a, a, a bolt with a, a nut behind and you just turn this eccentric to get the right adjustment. Things that are very different, that's what matches we're doing. Um, quite a nice bike, you, it's 
it still retains, and I did say I'd take this, this is the inline oil tap that goes from the feed to the pump. Now, I've left it on here because these pipes have big diameter, the oil lines, and I hadn't got any big lines to replace uh, this one with, because if we had taken the tap out, we would have needed a longer line. Another thing, Matchless did have the tendency to wet sump, so I've told the customer, if it does wet sump, you could actually keep this on here and turn it off, as you have done. You can upgrade these, I don't like these, I'll mention this, to a one that has like a micro switch, so when it's in your position, it cuts a spark out. But other than that, it runs really well. Um, it needs to be running a little bit. Compression's quite high. Oh, one thing I did miss, it's got a foot pump. Still got the original foot pump. But these were a good sidecar bike, and it, it's got the lugs on the side for the sidecar at the front here. It would have been mounted here, here. Those are the main fixing points, really. And I think also there's something that went through here as well for the sidecar. But we'll, we'll start it up for you, and you can hear it. I haven't started the bike today. Pipes are really cold. Now, because it's only been literally finished this week, um, I will give it choke this time. I'm going to tickle the carb and give it choke just to fire it the first time. The compression's quite high, so we'll just see how we go. You can see that sitting position, it's actually harder than you expect it to be. So your feet, if you're short, it's quite a long way down. Side stand, sprung, sprung loaded. So as soon as you move away, that springs back. We're just gonna turn the fuel on. We tickle the carb until the petrol comes out the top. We give it full choke, advance and retard. Fully advance this forward slack wire and fully retired is back taut wire so we're just going to bring that back a little bit find compression and give it a kick take it off the coat just going to let it warm up over a bit faster so at the moment I'm just keeping it going a little bit and I think I mentioned before if, if it may idle quite fast you just retard your lever a little bit I'm going to put it on the side stand Retard the lever, slows it down. And it will run a bit faster than it's warmed up. This came in for engine work. It does actually need a new battery. So if you don't see the brake light working, it's, it's because the battery isn't very good. It won't take a charge, but that's the customer's going to sort that out. But we just purely done the engine work. Now it's getting a bit warmer. I can retard this back. And it slows the tick over down. What you find sometimes when you have manual advance and retard is that you can be in traffic when they get warm. They run quite fast for the advance. And if you try and put it into gear, it's the job to get into gear. This happens with all bikes with manual advance and retard. All you want to do is just bring it back on retard. Get your tick over speed down. Put the bike into gear, advance it back up, then ride away. 
would never ride in a retarded position because it would get very hot very quickly. Well, much slower tick over now. When you come to stop these, they don't have, this is what matches used to do, don't know why, there's no button up here. You think, how do you stop it? Don't just stick it in gear and let it clutch out. It's got the button on the uh, magneto. Just press a button in. I don't know why they've done that, because all the other bikes with a magneto have a wire that comes up to a switch up here. But that's something they used to do. So when it's dark, you've got to put your hand down there and find it. But it, it's, it's how they used to do things, so it's as it should be. But it's quite a nice bike, and uh, we'll take it out now and just make sure it rides all right. Um, I think it would be very comfortable because the big seat and uh, very smooth engine. Okay, we've just given it uh, its first ride since the rebuild. Uh, it rides very well. In fact, I actually like it more than I did before. It's very comfortable, um, very smooth ride. It's got a lovely exhaust note. Um, yeah, it's actually grown on me. It's quite a nice bike. Um, what we'll do now, we'll do a hot start and we'll give it the full retard and you can see how slow it ticks over. So I'll just start her up for you now. running now on slight retard so you get a very slow tick over. Advance it back up, bring the speed up. Like I was saying earlier, the engine gets really hard when you go on auto advance and retard, uh, fourth manual rather. You can always bring your tick over speed down a bit slower to engage gear. Then put it into gear, then speed it up. But yeah, it's, it does rides really well. Very crisp. Okay, when we first started up the bike, Alec mentioned that uh, he noticed it was a little bit of smoke. Um, right, on this job, when we took it apart, we did find quite a lot of score marks in the barrels. Now, a little bit of marking on the pistons, they were cleaned up. Now, I think I might have mentioned, getting parts for matchless, 
um, motorcycles, engines, is very, very difficult. Getting parts of these, finding a crankshaft is like finding hen's teeth, really. Um, very lucky to get one. So the pistons you can't really get. A lot of pistons are adapted to fit. What we've done here, we put some rings in the thing, and we honed it out. Now, I think most people know this, but there's always tolerances to engines. And a, a piston is made so it will expand with heat. So when the engine is cold, there is more chance of, you hear a bit more rattling sound. All the metal inside, the aluminium, the pistons will expand with heat. Because if they didn't, if you didn't give them that clearance, tolerances, they would seize up, it would expand the aluminium and seize. So there is a certain amount of, always give an engine time to warm up, get it up to working temperature, it all becomes warmer and the parts will expand and that's how it works. So sometimes you find you might get a puff of smoke from something. It doesn't mean to say it's worn out when it's cold. It could be valve guys, it could be just a bit of oil in the top of the bores. That soon clears. Now we've ridden that all round today and I think you won't see any smoke from that engine at all. We've had it on tick over now and we've revved it a few times, it's clean. Um, but it's very hard getting parts for this. I mean, it's all cleaned up well. It's got a good crankshaft in there. It's been reground undersized with new shells and we have put rings in there. So we've managed to save that engine, but I say it can be hard to get parts for match lists. That's the only thing. BSA Norton Triumph, you can get those parts easily. They're readily available on the shelf, but it rides very well. Please with it.